Today I'm speaking with Ken Frank. Ken is a filmmaker. Uh, Ken, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you? Yeah, very good, very good. Sure. Uh, you're, you're in Japan at the moment, so there's a slight uh, delay, but uh, it's not too bad. Oop, can you see what I mean? Okay. But um, so I suppose the question is, um, again, like all people, how did you get involved in films? You know, what is it about films that you wanted to to make? Well, I was always, you know, when I was a little kid, my primary interest was, was always writing. And um, I went to um, NYU in New York, uh, the Tisch School of the Arts, the, the film school in New York. And um, I applied to and was accepted into the screenwriting program. And at the time when I was, you know, in high school applying for that, um, I, you know, love films and, and um, you know, this is, you know, 1999, I started there. Um, so we're still talking about celluloid film and making films seem completely out of reach. But I thought, this is great. I'll, I'll, I'll write and I'll be closer to that. Um, and then kind of lo and behold, when I was in school, um, we, we got, I learned Final Cut Pro 1. Like we literally had a digital video class and, um, you know, I learned the, the rudimentary um, stuff of digital video at, at the, the start of that. And then as I got out of school, I got a job as a teacher and I kind of remained interested in writing and, and tried to stay with the tech as it was going. And, and suddenly I found that um, I could do, we could do the things that I'd wanted to do that is no longer uh, economically out of reach for us. Um, and so um, In the Garage Productions, our, our company, um, really was uh, a buddy of mine and I um, who, who had written some scripts and, and were trying to get a film off the ground. And we ended up marrying two sisters and the four of us are in the garage production. My, my wife, Shauna, her sister, Brett, is married to my buddy, Chris. And the four of us have made these films, um, you know, really just as uh, telling. And, and for us, it's really about um, centering our work on characters and on performance, on, on telling a good story. And, and, and staying out of the way of the actors, um, you know, performing that story. Um, so we've been making micro budget features. Um, our first was called The Mix, which came out toward the end of 2017. We followed that up with Family Obligations and then most recently Sofa King. And then we have two features in post-production right now, UFO Club and My Sister's Wedding. Um, just because, you know, we really, um, you know, we feel like we have these stories to tell and, and we're in a place where, um, you know, now we can actually find an audience for them. So um, really this, I, I find myself doing things that I really, when I was younger, felt like I, they were not possible for me. Um, so I feel like it's a really exciting time to be a filmmaker um, because of what is possible. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Obviously technology is, is, a, is a big um, hurdle for lots of people, but it's getting easier all the time. What's, what's the sort of um, problems or sticking points or or sort of areas with micro budget films that you've had to sort of solve to, to get them done? Because obviously being a micro budget, you don't have loads of money to throw at it. So um, how's that sort of evolved and, and what you had to overcome? The approach to that is um, largely doing as much in prep as is humanly possible. Um, that the problems you solve with your script and in prep are the cheapest solutions you're going to find. Um, and then really, you know, learning as much as you can yourself so that if it's not something you can do yourself, you can intelligently discuss it with someone who is going to solve the problem for you. So like, for example, um, you know, as I said, my, my background, my training is as a, a writer um, and I took, you know, production classes and, and, and learned uh, and, and, you know, made short films as a director and things like that. But I, you know, ended up teaching myself uh, cinematography, you know, and I'm, I've DP'd three of the five feature films that we um, have made, you know, one of which I was the, the writer and director also, but I was also the DP for, for two other directors, because I realized this was a hurdle. This was something that we needed to, to be able to solve ourselves. And then the other films where we had a DP, um, because we were fortunate enough to have enough budget to have a DP, it's been incredibly helpful because I've had a, a better vocabulary to talk to the DP with. Um, you know, we all edit to a greater or lesser extent. Um, you know, we've learned more color correction and, and, and post-production sound as time's gone on. So I think, um, you know, as you said before, the technology gets easier. Uh, with that, you know, the more you're able to do yourself, obviously, the, the better off you're going to be. But also, 
even if you do grow into a place where you don't have to do everything yourself, I think you will appreciate and understand the process that much better. I'm also fortunate. My wife, uh, Shauna is our EP and she's a great line producer. She really is great at breaking down the scripts and getting us to a place where we're very economical with our shoot days. And I feel like we really get the most out of um, our budgets because we're maximizing our accuracy, we're maximizing our locations. And, you know, our attitude is that I've talked to a lot of filmmakers who um, are very patient. And I think it's a wonderful thing to be patient and, and wait for the budget to come to them to make the film they have in their head. But we really have been striving to have a body of work. And I think to have a body of work, you need to keep moving. Um, yeah. So we've been trying to make movies with what we can and then go on to make more movies. Um, you know, we joke about, you know, how do we make our money? Quantity. And we don't, we don't make our money. <laughs> this is not a, a huge profit game, but we're very, very proud of the fact that we're able to continue to make these and that because of the situation we're in, um, we can get them out to an audience. And then I think that having a few films behind you um, makes finding that audience easier. So I'm hoping that with each film, we grow a little in terms of audience in that way. Yeah, <clears throat> that makes um, perfect sense. And I think it, it's the, the only option to filmmakers today, really, if you're not on Netflix and if you're not part of the sort of big comic book universe and all that sort of thing. Um, do you think that perhaps more filmmakers, be it new filmmakers who are making their, their first feature, or maybe people perhaps have been um, making films for a while that have just been lucky enough to be thrown lots of money at for their maybe the first or second feature. Do you think that they, they miss something if they haven't made six, seven films beforehand and this is their first film and they're kind of suddenly, oh shit, what do I do with all the money? That's such, a, that's such a great question, yeah. Yeah, do, do, do you think it, it, it hinders them? I mean, you know, it's a great question because I think that, um, you know, I worked as a teacher for, for many years and um, ingrained in kind of educational practice and teaching is this idea of, you know, skill mastery requires repetition and requires that you, you have the craft. And, um, you know, if that's shooting free throws in a basketball game, you can go out with your ball in the backyard and, and you know, stand 15 feet from the basket and keep shooting. Um, but you can't do that with film. Film is such a costly resource intensive, uh, people intensive practice that to muster together the people to make a film always costs. Even if you have the gear uh, and you have the people, it costs your time. It costs so much, you know, uh, that being able to work at it enough to get good enough to where you're going to feel comfortable doing it feels completely impossible to me. The idea that I would, the idea that I would make enough uh, shoot enough scenes, make enough films that I could say, yeah, I understand this. I'm really good at this now. Um, I'm so far off from that, I feel, because I just feel like I don't, I have not been on set that much, you know? Um, uh, so I, I, I do think there's, there's probably something to getting that practice in and, and, and maybe that's shooting a ton of stills or maybe it's, you know, always having a camera in your hands or, or watching a ton of films. I, at the same time, I think that films are fortunately a collaborative medium. I think that if you are fortunate enough, like the scenario you described where maybe you land uh, an opportunity and funding to make something big and it, you know, you haven't done it before. Um, I think that if you're fortunate enough to be in that situation, hopefully you're fortunate enough to have really good teams around you. Um, and I think you, you could certainly be successful. Um, you know, I, I don't know your experience in, in making films with this, but I watched things I did and, you know, of course you wish you could go back and do better. And I think you're always gonna do that. I think you're always gonna look at something you did and say, oh man, if I knew then what I know now, this would have been a much more effective scene or this, this story point wouldn't have gotten <clears throat> lost in the shuffle. Um, so I think you're inevitably going to have those regrets or, or kind of, you know, wish you could have a, a, a second try at it. But, um, you know, hopefully you can have the team you need to be successful, even, even if maybe you're not, as seasoned a filmmaker as you think you should be. Um, yeah. Just because I really do believe that. And I would love, I, I say this all the time to people, I would love to think that making film was like my teaching job where you say, well, I taught a lesson. I'm gonna go into this classroom and teach another lesson. I'll get up tomorrow and I'll teach five more lessons. 
I'm not thinking that much about it. I'm doing my job. I put in the prep time, but like, let's not get too precious here. You have to keep doing this thing. If that were filmmaking to me, I would not recognize myself. To me, every time I'm on set is like this miraculous thing because it took so much to get there. It took all these resources and all the work to get those resources to be there. So I can't ever imagine being on autopilot on set because I, I don't think I'll ever get that much time in. Um, and I'm, there, there are people like that. There are people who are out shooting, whether it's corporate or commercial or, or maybe even people working in, say, television, something where you're, you're on set all the time. Um, man, that must be amazing to flex those muscles like that all the time. But for me, um, in some respects, each film is like a first film because you show up and it's a new group of people. Yeah. And, it, and it, new it, situations, it, it's a new script. It's so, telling the story. Yeah, that your you experience is, is obviously hugely important, but. Yeah. And it, it's telling the story that yeah. you want to tell. I, I've, I've spoken to people who have come from, say, like a corporate background in, in filmmaking or photography that they get a very, very lucrative gig with like big companies to go, oh, can you follow us around and, and take photos or do some filming that will end up in like a five second clip of their advert. But, and they do that for a number of years because it pays the bills and everything else and they travel around the world, great. But they still get to the same point where I, I want to make my film now. You know, they're not, they're not happy doing that. They still want to, well, I've been doing all this. I've got a little bit of money in my pocket, but I still want to go and do what, what you've been describing as in every day is the first day on a, a film set. So it's almost like, well, if you're going to get there anyway, why not? kind of just go and do it to begin with you know? that's really my our experience and it's funny because we've been fortunate enough to to take a feature of ours to some some bigger festivals and and therefore people um treat you like you're a bigger deal sometimes you know it's a very funny thing but uh we made this you know feature film uh, a film i wrote and directed family obligations made it for sixteen thousand dollars and we played a couple of nice festivals and, and people wanted to talk to us saying well, you know, you made this feature, this must have been a, a large production. And then when they kind of realize that it's a, a smaller production, there's sort of a, a disappointment that sets in because a lot of the people you speak to are, are writers or directors who in their head think, well, you know, I'm going to get to a certain dollar amount and then I'll be able to make this film happen. And I understand that. It's very understandable. Yeah. But at the same time, there is that kind of thing of like, well, if you waited for that, how long will you wait? And, and will you ever get there? And if you got there once, is there any chance you could get there a second time? And so, yeah, I think there is an impulse to, after, after maybe waiting a, a while and, and being patient and thinking that's where you're gonna go, to, to then going, all right, what does it really take? What's gonna really get me out there? Not in the ideal scenario, not everything I wanted, but how can I best tell the story and what do I need to tell the story and let's go do that. Um, and maybe that is just a couple of different mindsets, um, you know, an industry mindset versus an independent mindset. Uh, maybe it's the nature of the story you're telling. Um, but for me, it's, it's worth it to have the piece of work. It, it, to me, it's about the body of work. It's about telling the stories. And, um, you know, uh, I'm not questing after big sales and, and um, you know, a contract or, or next gig. I'm not looking for someone to hire me. I'm fortunate enough. I'm I'm writing and I'm I'm telling my own stories, or I'm working with a, a couple of other, uh, you know, close collaborators telling their stories, and we're we're telling the stories we want to tell, and you know, we're we're certainly looking for people to watch them, and we want them to be successful, and we want to have the best sure. possible audience for them. But it's not in that mold of, is this saleable? Who who wants to buy this from me? It's really more what do I want to do with it, um, and that that makes much more sense to me. I I, I understand the need. Uh, in the industry for for that financial motive, but from where I sit, it's much more interesting to work that way. Work work where I get to determine the product I'm making, not is someone else going to like this? You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I I understand it. I mean, that's interesting from from your experience and position from the make the films that you're making. Do you? What's your opinion on? Obviously, the last few years has a, been a major sort of re, restructuring of the Netflix becoming um, such a huge thing, Amazon as well, and then you've got various other streaming platforms. And it's almost, 
the, the cinema experience has kind of got smaller in terms of big blockbusters. Obviously, they've been around for like 30 years or so. But it's almost like you've got two different types of film now. You've got comic book films and 100 million plus budget films. Or you've got um, much smaller films because the, the middle ground doesn't exist anymore, you know, like a 30, 40 million pound um, film. So you've got much smaller films, but they're almost like they're almost treading on TV dramas in, in a way, in terms of they're perhaps shot much quicker, much, much smaller budget, although obviously some TV dramas have big budgets. But, and they kind of, that's, that's cinema. That's film, and this is movie. Do you think there's a big gap, or or do you think it's more diverse than that? And it's just what I've been watching. <laughs> I think it's 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 interesting because there's a couple of things going on, obviously, in that. I think that, um, like personally, the movies that we make, to me, I'm, I'm 40 years old, right? So when I was growing up. And when I was first going to movies and the movies that I gravitated toward uh, um, in that period of like, say, the late 1980s through the middle to late 1990s, um, I liked what were those kind of mid-budget comedy and drama films. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not really a genre guy, and I know a lot of the indie community is <clears throat> horror and sci-fi, and, and, you know, that's, that's fantastic. But those were that was never my taste. So for me, the movies that I love and the movies that i seek to make are those movies that don't exist in the cinema anymore um yeah. you know it's it's uh, almost also that exception you know to such a level that you can almost say they don't exist at all anymore every once in a while one or two comes out and it's so quirky and strange but um you know not franchise films not action um you know all these things like again mid-budget level um films that that we're making you know now feel very indie but I, I don't i don't think of my tastes as being inherently indie tastes they're just tastes yeah. that were mainstream and are no longer so the second part of that is that those now those films if they're being made and they are still being made but they're not being released theatrically are landing on streaming so in a way you know um though we all love the cinema experience, we all love going to the, the movies and seeing on the big screen and all that kind of stuff. You almost have to say, the environment we're really living in is the streaming environment. Um, our films will play big screens at festivals, which is fantastic and we love that. <clears throat> we know that 99% of the audience we're gonna get is in a streaming market. And that whole catalog of films I'm mentioning from years gone by are in the stream market. So in a sense, while you can view it as an independent filmmaker, you can do it kind of uh, pessimistically and say, oh, well, that's closed off to me and I can't get a theatrical release and no one's going to see me in the cinema. Um, I see it as, you know, my film, my films are sitting in a catalog alongside all these other huge films and getting the data back from distributors, they are getting seen. I mean, you're not getting nearly the eyeballs that huge films are getting, but, sure. but they are being found in the same places that some of these big films are being found. And I think that's really exciting. I think it's really great that rather than the film existing just in a small window of time in these select cities, the film exists for millions of people on demand at any point. Uh, that's huge. That's huge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I see the opportunity. I, I like to see the opportunity in that, but I do think that, you know, what you said about the, the, you know, the, 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 the Marvel cinematic universe movies and the, you know, the, the superhero movie, and then everything else um <clears throat> you do have to recognize that that pushes everybody into that that huge sea of content and it does become harder to distinguish yourself um because you are with everybody else so yeah. it you have to fight for that audience in the sense that you have to do a much you have to do much more of the work yourself and you have to do a much better job of you know your your voice your brand your story uh being visible when you can finding effective ways of reaching people who might be interested in your film and that's hard that's not you know as filmmakers that's not what any of us dream of when we get into it right we don't think about writing a script so that you can place ads on youtube or that you can you know <laughs> yeah. show up with your poster at a festival um you want to make the movie and you want to go on to make the next movie but you have to spend some time thinking about 
how you reach people with it and can you get reviews for it and what are people going to say and what are your talking points when you get up there what are the things you want to make, make sure you mention and that's um you know it's an education it's it's interesting to learn how to do that a little more effectively each time do you, do you think it is almost the the trade-off between technology that what you've got on your phone these days is a good camera compared to 30 years ago versus everything you've just mentioned as in but the downside of being able to make a film for a thousand dollars is the fact that you've got to also have a marketing uh, department and um, a distribution department and also sort of the knowledge of <clears throat> networking a thousand people and, and saying look forget about all the other films watch my film and the one one's got easy but one's got much harder <clears throat> yeah it's it, it is incredible to think that um the tools have never been better or more widely available. And, and um, it's so exciting to be a filmmaker for that reason. But, you know, as you said, um, the struggle is to me, not in making the film, but in getting the film seen. And, you know, the, the, the first film we made was like, wow, can we make this film? And then it was like, after you've made the film what's next and you realize that you put you put everything into making the film that you have no answers for what comes next and then you realize that you have to have you know you learn you, you go back to the drawing board and you say okay the next time you make a film think about how it's going to be seen and it sounds ludicrous because obviously you yeah. should be thinking about how it's, it should be seen but when you're in the throes of making it that's the hardest thing in the world and and uh, why are you asking me about stuff i haven't gotten to yet so mm -hmm. Yes, it, it, it's, it's tough to um, be on both sides of, of, that, of that line in terms of, you know, working so hard with all the logistics and all the creative decisions of making the film, and then also having to be incredibly pragmatic and say, when does this, you know, when does this thing actually reach people? How does it reach people? Um, that's the part that, you know, unfortunately, I think um, is still not in the filmmaker's hands the way people want yeah. it to be. I think that, you know, if, if you and I were having this conversation 20 years ago, we would say, I wish I had a more powerful camera set of lenses. I wish I had affordable, portable lighting. I wish I had better sound equipment. You know, and all those things have come true. Those things have absolutely come true. Now you're saying, I wish I had a way to get my film out to an audience where I wasn't giving so much of it up I wasn't at the whim of all these larger forces and great strides have been made for sure. But I think that there's still, still sort of a stranglehold um, on the audiences from the big players, understandably so. So that's the thing that hasn't quite broken down for indie audiences. I think you still have to convince people to take a chance on a small film because there's so much great content. Why risk, why risk ruining your night? We can, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you're not going to like when you know there's just wonderfully high quality production big name cast things you could be watching that other people have said are fantastic you know it's i've i can find your film my film someone else's film mm -hmm. you know when you have a hundred years of cinema ready for you yeah I, 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 absolutely and you know i mean i'm i'm very much guilty of this you know i i tend to watch the same old films you know um the ones that i watched as a as a child and i mean I, we all do but um it's I, I i was having this conversation not that long ago with another um uh filmmaker who's who's crowdfunding his his sort of comedy horror sort of film um and it kind of occurred to, well occurred to me but both of us that you've got the kind of the niche which is a very very big niche of horror films there's lots of horror independent films coming out there, and they seem to have their ready-made audience for that. Um, a lot of the time, not always, but yeah, some of the time that the writing's not great, but you could say, well, that's a horror, so so what? But it's, it's almost like if you actually wanted to make a film that is is not just a sort of run-of-the-mill horror horror film or sci-fi film, or it, it is a drama, it is actually about people it is you know reasonably well written it's almost that yeah that is going up against 
the bigger films, even though the, as I said those big Hollywood and that sort of stuff don't tend to make a lot of those films anymore. Somehow it's still going up against the ones from the 80s, 90s, noughties and all that sort of thing. But it's, it's almost, how do you get that idea yeah. across? It's a, it's a strange phenomenon. Yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, uh, no, no, just, uh, yeah, no, yeah. It, it's very hard. It's because it's, it's, it's hard to place that, isn't it? It's hard to know how you would reach that audience for that. And also, I think a lot of um, comedies, you know, I, I, I like, I mean, I like all sorts of films, but I, li I like comedies. I like watching comedies, but I was trying, I was really struggling to remember the last funny film I saw, like truly funny, the film that actually made me laugh rather than, yeah, yeah, okay, that's, that's okay. And it seems to be that, that's the thing that, you know, there's, there's brilliant stand-ups, there's brilliant shows where you can see very, very funny people. But again, it doesn't seem to be translating to films at the moment. I don't know if you disagree. No, I think the, the horror comparison is so interesting to me because I've had the experience, and, and I don't know, you know, how many film festivals you get around to or whatever, but but it's, you know, seemingly at, at any independent film festival um, you go to, big or small, there will be at least one block of horror shorts. There'll probably be a couple of horror features. And I've just had the, the experience of having my films programmed like right in front of those. And I'll be, the auditorium will be opening up and I'll be leaving my film with a handful of people who've come to see it. And there will be a huge crowd waiting to pile in for the horror block that's about to start. And you realize that, you know, um, when you get to certain genres or you get to certain niches in the market, um, you have that ready-made audience. And, and it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Like what a, what a great idea to say, well, I like this type of movie and they're making this type of movie. I'm going to go see it. I mean, it's, you know, it, it's inherently logical and, and makes perfect sense. And like you said, you know, there's, there's like high concept horror and there's very low budget horror and there's all kinds of, you know, but, but fans of horror are, are dedicated to it. So they'll go to a festival and watch a bunch of horror films by filmmakers they don't know with actors they don't know um and they give themselves over to it but i think if you say you know come see this comedy feature and nobody you've ever seen before is in it it's directed by somebody you not you haven't heard of you go ah, pass you know and it's it's the 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 difference in how those audiences are kind of groomed and how i think the community forms around them and stuff like that and you know what i think uh, I don't know if it's the answer, but an answer to that is, you know, filmmakers really aggressively cultivating their own audience or, or uh, whether it's festivals cultivating an audience or there's got to be some gathering point um, that you hopefully can latch on to where you create yourself, where you say, well, this is the, these are the people that, that want to see my movie and I'm making it and I know they will, they will watch it. Um, because going out and finding the audience is really, is the hard part. Um, and that's the thing I think that independent filmmakers are constantly trying to crack. And I think there's the promise of that from so many different avenues, whether it's social media or crowdfunding or different kind of DIY distribution networks, um, aggregators. There's so many different ways that people have tried to do this. And I think that to the average independent filmmaker, it's still a little out of reach. But the horror comparison is, is so apt because that is a community that will support independent films of all stripes, of all budget levels. And it's, it's wonderful to see. And it's, you know, you wish you could port that over into drama, comedy, documentary, you know, what have you, but it doesn't, it doesn't quite translate the way it doesn't horror. Yeah, it, it, it's an interesting one. I mean, I've thought about it quite a few, and lots of people have, I'm sure. Um, there, yeah, there is something to it. I, I don't quite know what it is why it doesn't translate as as well um in from from when you first started trying to go down this this road or, or, or succeeding at it and, and writing and everything else um why are so many again i i try to watch lots of film particularly short films at the moment but feature films as well and it's very rare that I've seen a film that technically isn't competent or even very, very good. Like lots of films 
uh, to a standard are very, very good these days, but lots of the writing isn't. What, what, what is it that um, lets that fall down? Is it just that they're not collaborating with better writers? They're, no one's holding them accountable. What, what, in your opinion, I think there's there's a couple things going on. I think I think someone not holding you accountable is is um, is very uh, often the case. I think, um, and I, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, a script being developed traditionally for a long period of time can also equally, I think, drain life out of it. But I think sometimes a writer goes unchallenged. I think that. Um, maybe not everyone's shooting a first draft, but people are shooting um, a script that hasn't been put through the ringer the way it needs to be. Um, I think that, you know, my buddy Chris and I will, will talk about this a lot. We'll say that um, great movies are in imitations of life and that kind of inferior movies are imitations of other movies. And I think sometimes people are writing what they've seen or what they kind of intuitively think movies are or what they think an audience expects. And that can be inauthentic and it can be counter to what you're trying to do in your story. Uh, and I think sometimes you see kind of very movie, you know, classic movie scenes being paraded through the film instead of telling the story in kind of an authentic and individual way. Um, I will also say that at a, at a lower budget level, um, you know, shooting, shooting the script you, you wanted to write can be cumbersome and sometimes in the process, you end up losing these, you know, uh, an example from our own work, um, my film Family Obligations, I had a version of it that the runtime probably would have been around 100 minutes, you know, an hour and 40. And I had a couple of extra scenes in it that I thought really developed the character, uh, the characters a little more. I felt that it, it, it brought a little depth to a subplot and things like that. And end of the day, looking at the shooting schedule, we could not make 105 pages work with the budget we had. I could make about 94 pages work with the budget we had. And so you get in there and you start making cuts and you realize that you're now telling a slightly different story. Yeah. And I think that, you know, that can be done well, but I think sometimes that, that story gets sacrificed um, to the process at times, whether that's budget, it's time. Sometimes you're not working with or sometimes people are not working with the performers that they need to pull off something. You know, there's a lot of things that can happen that are, that are beyond the script. I mean, going to school for screenwriting, I have the utmost respect for um, people who have credits that will often tell you that movie stunk, but I wrote a great script, you know, and, and the, they are there. Obviously there's a little uh, kind of jest in there or kind of a little defense, but you know how genuinely true it can be because you know, going from script to screen is not a simple translation. And so what sometimes was working well on the page doesn't work well on the screen. But I think, you know, most cases, it probably is a problem on page and it is something where people are not maybe necessarily addressing structural issues in the, in the story. Um, and therefore, I think a lot of times, you know, there's, there's like little things that if the sound is bad, people will think the lighting is off or like, you know, you put your finger on something and maybe the thing you're identifying isn't itself the problem, but it is an indication there is a problem. Yeah. Um, and I think that a lot of times they are story problems. You know, I, I think a lot of times that people will say that something is bad acting and it's really bad writing. You know, you say, who could deliver that line? That line is awkward, you know, or that, that moment isn't earned. And that actor has to work so hard to earn that moment that it feels over the top. <clears throat> um, so I think a lot of times it is the writing. Um, and a lot of times what feels like a clunky scene is an out of place scene the story point isn't quite earned or the the groundwork hasn't been laid for the audience to understand what's going on so i think that one of the joys of, of writing you know and, and and producing your own stuff is that you don't have a gatekeeper you don't have someone developing you and and editing you but you still very much need to be edited you know um just because you're not answering to an external authority you still need to hold yourself to the standard of if I put this in front of an audience, do they understand it? Is it is it getting from point A to point B? Am I earning the the changes, the reversals, the arc? Um, and those are those are questions that, you know, I think once you've gone through this process of of making the film, you really start to understand. Oh man, I 
I lost the forest for the trees there. And sometimes it is just a simplifying. It is like a streamlining. You're trying to do way too much. If you go back to that core thread through the narrative, what's supposed to happen, you can get yourself back on track. Or at least that's my thought. Yeah, no, and I, I, I agree. And it, it, as you break it down like that, it makes perfect sense. Um, what do you see the future for certainly independent film making in the next say four or five years do you, do you see anything massively changing is it just more of the same um anything you looking forward to changing anything that you hope doesn't change well a couple of things have gotten and uh, you know i'm speaking from an american experience here because that's where i'm making my films um a couple of factors have made things a little harder um namely uh the sag contract has gotten more expensive so what we paid where we had to pay our actors if, we, if you know and you can make a film without union cast and that's a different option but we made um four of the five films we feature films we've made have been sag productions meaning that we had a sag contract and we paid um a minimum rate that's set by them not by us i don't determine when i pay my actors yeah. um, i must pay them this benchmark um that just went up significantly so that's obviously an economics thing and it's wonderful and the actors are certainly worth it um, and they are working hard and they deserve their pay. But that is a consideration when you're working on meager resources. That makes things a little harder. Um, health and safety protocols have been put in place due to COVID have also made budgets tighter because you need to have a COVID compliance officer and you need to have PPE. And, you know, so there's a strain on the production end financially, which, um, you know, always makes things a little more complicated. And then on the distribution end, um, a couple of shakeups have been, happened fairly recently where, you know, going back a little ways, one of the major sort of DIY distributor aggregator forms distributor went, went belly up and a lot of independent filmmakers were left finding out what to do with their films uh, again. And then Amazon changed its, um, its acceptance, its, its curatorial practice, whatever you want to say in terms of the films that accepts in a place which was a, a huge um, share of the audience for independent film. Just, a, you know, films being seen for free on Amazon Prime accounted for so many of the eyeballs for films. So those are a couple of things that have negatively impacted um, how we do our films. Um, and there's many positives in that the technology is getting better and, and cheaper and easier to use and, and faster. Um, so for me, it's about kind of our growth. It's about, you know, we made films a certain way. How can we try to make these films better? How can we try to get them seen? How can we play better festivals? How can we maybe get better distribution? How can we grow an audience? And you know, one thing I can say for certain is that it's not going to stay the same for very long. Um, you know, we have done um, we've distributed three features so far with two different companies. We have one film with we have two. I'm sorry, we have two films with the same company, and we have a third film with uh, the first company, and the 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 deals for all three were, were wildly different um, just in terms of the term sheet, uh, where they ended up, the experiences with them. Um, and we're talking about, you know, 2017, 2019, 2020. So in that short a period of time, uh, the experience of releasing a film has gotten different each time. So um, I don't think it is something you can get really comfortable with because I think it's always going to be a moving target. Sure. Um, I think, you know, you have to keep in mind what you're trying to do and what you're trying to get out of it. Um, because I think if you're trying to guess where it's going to be, I think you're going to be very unlikely to, to figure that out. But I think if you figure out what you're trying to do, you can maybe be successful in a couple of key points and, and maybe move the ball forward in your own filmmaking. And to me, that's worthwhile. It's, it's worth it to try to you know, reach a better audience. You know, for, for one of the films we have coming out, um, we have a sales agent and a, and a festival handler. We have a person who's going to, you know, handle getting us into festivals and, and courting distribution offers. And I hope that means we play better festivals and we get better distribution. Um, <clears throat> it's an experiment, um, but it's something we weren't able to do with our, our earlier films because we didn't have the profile and we didn't have the budget. True. But we've managed to grow into that. And that's exciting because hopefully that leads to better returns and hopefully that leads to a, a bigger next film. So to me, it's always about finding tangible ways you can grow and quantifiable things you can hit so that you feel like you're putting yourself in a better position each time you go out there and make a film. Yeah, absolutely. I say it's it's progression, isn't it? It's it's learning and getting getting stronger and better for, for the next one. Um, <clears throat> I really appreciate uh, speaking with you. 
Uh, we, we've covered lots and lots of really good stuff. Um, what 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 is your next uh, project that you're looking to sort of get in together? Uh, if you want to mention it, if it's something you want to sort of start promoting, and how do people sort of contact you if, if they're interested in 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 your work in your films? Um, saying hi in social media all that stuff. certainly yeah no we'd love to connect with people um so my name is ken frank my uh twitter handle is at kenneth r frank uh k-e-n-n-e-t-h-r-f-r-a-n-k -E -E um our company's in the garage productions and we're on twitter facebook instagram in the garage productions um our films are the mix family obligations and sofa king they're out and streaming now um you can find them on amazon in the us and uk for the mix and family obligations um I don't know what Tubi TV is like in the UK. Do you guys have Tubi we TV? Don't, a... No, we don't have it. I've I've okay. gone on there several times and it says it's not available in the UK. So it's, I think it's mainly okay. US. Yeah, I know I know in the US I, I'm finding, you know, now that I'm in I'm in Japan right now, I'm finding where things kind of work and where things don't. But um uh, our films are on disc, um mixes on uh, DVD and Sofa King and Family Allegations are on Blu-ray, available at major retailers, uh, you know, Amazon, uh, Walmart, Target, uh, FYE, uh, Turner Classic Movies, and um, uh, we're streaming in a bunch of other places that I, you know, depending upon where you are in the world, Plex and uh, uh, Hoopla Digital and things like that. But uh, we also have, you know, so so check those films out: The Mix, Family Obligations, and Sofa King. Um, and we have two films coming out soon, hopefully to festivals and, and places near you: UFO Club, written and directed by Steven Sapelis, and uh, my second feature as a writer director, My Sister's Wedding. So um, say hi to us on social, uh, connect with us. Uh, we'd love for you to see the films and. You know, if anyone out there sees the films, uh, re leaving a review is a huge thing for independent filmmakers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so if you can rate, whether it's on IMDb or Amazon or whatever service, um, that is a huge boost. So whenever you see someone's independent film, a, a friend, uh, uh, someone you've come across, a stranger, whatever, um, it really means the world to us if, if we get those things rated. So, um, you know, I'd encourage you to do that for any independent film you see because it means a lot to the people who make the film. No, absolutely. I mean, it's just, it's just nice um, feedback and, um, you know, you feel that actually, yes, someone is watching and someone has liked it. You know, it does does make a, a big difference. Um, I just want to say uh, thank you for speaking with us today, Ken. Um, hopefully we can uh, speak in the future as well when when your next uh, films are out through the festivals and after that we, we could sort of touch, touch base again. But um, it's, you know, it's it's hard, but the same time yeah, that'd be it, wonderful thank you so much for having me i really appreciate it yeah no no problem at all again it's making films is hard at any period of the last hundred years um but yeah it's it's a exciting time <laughs> right now and yeah it's changing by the day but um you know it's also uh, a lot of opportunity as well so um it's yeah it's all good stuff uh, yeah thank you very much for for speaking with us